and then gradually the age of reason starts coming apart because reason always succeeds mostly in canceling itself. And then you have a revival of religion, and and you sooner or later we're back to um, the dark ages. Hello, everybody. We are here this evening with John Michael Greer, cultist and author. He's been an arch druid and a number of interesting things. Now, John, I think what is interesting, like Daniel and I come from a segment, a little subculture of the internet where we're very plugged into technology and daydreaming mm-hmm. about where technology might lead us. And I, from what I've gathered from your work, there may be a big difference there that I think you are more of the perspective that we may be going into like a serious industrialization and a lot of the technologies that we have are perhaps going to fizzle out. Mm-hmm. However, I don't think that's where I want to kick off this interview. And okay. Like I think where, as I was just saying to you before we started, will be fun to begin is actually in something I heard you talking about on a uh, on a Druid podcast about mm-hmm. an Italian Renaissance, I think it was Renaissance thinker called oh, Gian yeah. Vico, who was yeah, Vico, talking yeah. about the, the shifts and phases that cultures go through, and especially this idea about image-based cultures shifting into conceptual cultures or abstract mm-hmm. cultures. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Could you tell me just a little bit about what that idea is and what his okay. of the cycle is? Okay, was? well, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Let's start with Vico himself. Um, yeah, he was Italian. He was d- d- right at the absolute end of the Renaissance. Um, he was born in the, in the mid-17th century, died in the mid-18th century, um, corresponded briefly with people like Isaac Newton and so on. Um, but he was really the first person in modern Western history to notice the history runs in circles, that you have the same patterns repeating in general, not, obviously not in specific details, but that certain patterns repeat themselves in the life cycle of every civilization. The one you, you brought up here is one of the most important he discovered that um, by way of – he was a historian of law, among other things, and he noticed that um, ancient Roman law is very well documented. We, we have the, the law of, laws of the Twelve Tables, and it goes on from there up to the very late imperial law covering um, you know, umpty ump centuries. And the laws start out with – really, really specific, concrete things. If a man steal a loaf of bread, let him be beaten seven times with, a, with an ash stick. <laughs> that kind of thing. Okay. And n- no abstraction. It's totally concrete, totally specific. And it went from there through going through the changes, becoming more generalized, more abstract, more conceptual, layers upon layers of meaning, and you finally get the late classical imperial law with the codices and the pandects and the commentaries, this immense body of legal scholarship. Okay? Then the Dark Ages hit. And in dark in Europe during the Dark Ages, law codes started being. Um, Alfred the Great did one. All, all the, the 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 major kings of the European Dark Ages had their law code. And what do you find there? If a man steal a loaf of bread, let him be beaten twelve times with an ash stick. All the way back to the concrete. And then it went through the same process. Now, Vico didn't. Vico lived before anybody was able to translate um, Babylonian law codes, for example. So he never had the chance to look at the at the laws of Hammurabi and find the same thing about loaves of bread and ash sticks and the equivalent. Um, and going through that same process from the extremely simple, from the extremely concrete, imagistic, um, material, all the way to these very complicated, subtle. Um, abstract, ideational, conceptual structures. And then it all came crashing down, as it always had, does. Now, that was originally that was what interested me in Vico, because he had an explanation of why things fall apart, why civilization doesn't just go mounting up um, you know, through history, but you have this, this arc of rise and fall from a loaf of bread and an ash stick to a loaf of bread and an ash stick, um, passing through 15 dozen volumes of commentaries in the middle. And so where does the development of religion and religious thinking fit? Uh, that's, that, that's an important part of his scheme. 
because religion is strong when concrete thought, thought is strong. Um, religion was very influential in ancient Rome at the time, at the time of the very simple laws. As civilizations develop, they go through, again, a life cycle away from the concrete imagery of religion, the concrete symbolism, through an age of reason, where everyone goes, oh, that stuff's complete nonsense. Um, and then gradually the age of reason starts coming apart because reason always succeeds mostly in canceling itself. And then you have a revival of religion, and, and sooner or later we're back to um, the Dark Ages and, um, you know, loaves of bread and ash sticks, or the religious equivalent. So again, it's a movement from the concrete to the abstract. When in, in, in the period of, in the, of concrete thinking, you have people thinking of, of basic principles of creation as people, whether that's Jupiter, the thunder god, or whether that's the Christian god, or whether it's the, the, the gods of the Babylonians or what have you. But principles have to take the form of concrete, abstract, concrete people, concrete people with passions, with stories, with narratives, with lives, They're, where are they born, this kind of stuff. And as you get more and more abstract, that just kind of dissolves, and you end up with um, these very abstract philosophical concepts, which again fall apart. And then, we're, again, we're back to the concrete. Right. And uh, so, Daniel, you go. Yeah, so uh, would you say that technology has a role in mediating the speed with which these cycles occur, or not really? I'm not really. About, okay. um, the cycles occur, take about the same length of time, whether we are talking a technology of stone tools or whether we're talking a technology of advanced uh, metalwork, um, long distance naval transportation, um, you know, uh, complex mathematics and logic and, and schools of higher education, uh, as the Roman world had or the imperial Chinese world. It takes about the same length of time. I see mm -hmm. technology as a dependent variable. It's the way that a society turns its abstractions into machinery. And if those abstractions are of certain kinds, you end up with stone tools. If they're of a different kind, you end up with um, Roman chariots and, and, and um, aqueducts. And if they're with, in our particular kind, you end up with internet computers and space capsules. But it's all, in a t it's all sort of a grounding out of the, t of the ideas of the abstract forms that were originally present in those original religious images. You watch the way that um, the book of Genesis gets turned into the Big Bang. You know, in the beginning, God created, and there, let there be light, boom. It's the same story, but turned into technology, or turned into, into, into abstract science. And then those same patterns of thinking lead us to um, a technology which is very much focused on, on the idea of, of omnipotence, the idea that we can erase distance, we can act like whichever gods our ancestors worshipped. Roman technology was, was an attempt to act like Jupiter. Um, our technology is an attempt to act like, like God, um, the Babylonians likewise. Mm -hmm. And so maybe the implication of this insight about the cycles is that within the life cycle of an empire, there mm -hmm. comes a time where by you know, going towards that age of reason, it cancels itself mm -hmm. out and mm -hmm. perhaps becomes a shell of, of, of its formal, former mm -hmm. uh, vitality and just disappears. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, that's, ex that's exactly what Vico is suggesting. The way he phrases it is that you start out with what he calls the barbarism of sense or barbarism of sensation, which is where you have too few concepts. All you have are concrete realities. And so the capacity to think clearly is basically not there because all you have is rocks and, and, and physical objects. Over the life of a society, concepts gradually build up and become more and more and more complex until finally be, they become too complex and too unwieldy for anyone to actually use, actually use. Then you have what he calls the barbarism of reflection where the same kinds of barbarian behaviors occur, but everyone has the most, the, all of these, these words, all of these abstractions to try mm. to defend the fact that they're acting like Visigoths. Mm. And so from the barbarism of sense to the barbarism of reflection, in the middle is a period where you have enough concepts to, to be able to deal with the world and not too many to, that you lose yourself in them. And right. the reason that, that an age of reason winds down is precisely the, the sort of overproduction of concepts. 
I mean, right, we're kind of an extreme example because we've really put a lot of of our energy as a civilization into developing these complex sciences, each of which is entirely independent. The Romans would have thought that was crazy. Their, their idea is that every science should have the same principles. That's where you get Greek and Roman philosophy from. But to, to us, every science has to have its own principles. And so literally, there's no way that a human mind can hold more than a tiny fragment of the whole. And so we're lost floundering in the sea of abstractions that none of us can really deal with. And the barbarism of reflection follows promptly. I'm glad you got that because I was just thinking like, not only say in the sphere of science, but with the the abstractions that we have things like progress or justice that everyone's like, oh, <laughs> yeah, progress, yeah. good, justice, good. But we haven't got a fucking clue what they mean. You can point yeah, at someone would. and say that guy is impeding progress. That guy is impeding justice. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and what does it mean? It means whatever people in people who are powerful in the moment want it to mean. It's, it becomes just a slogan. And then everyone starts treating it as a slogan, and it, the whole thing falls to pieces. So that's Vico's vision of how societies um, bud, blossom, go to seed and fall off, of, go to seed and fall off the vine. Um, and it works fairly well, certainly looking at our society right now awash in the barbarism of reflection where um, we have all these competing groups yelling about progress and justice and similar empty sounds, um, meaning by them, I get what I want and you get screwed. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Because yes, that's what yes. it comes down to. You know, it, it, what happens is that the whole structure begins, people just start walking away. And they typically walk away into some system of simple concrete images. That's how Christianity took over in the Roman world. People were desperately tired of this of this vast yes. teetering mound of abstractions, and here you had these people saying, "No, no, forget all that. Um, God died to save you. These are the things you have to do. These are the way you have to behave. It's really simple." And yes, that was and that was that was enough. That was what did it. I think Eric Davis even says in Technosis that, or perhaps someone that he quotes in that book about the period of the emergence of Christianity, that at that time, there were so many cults and such proliferation mm -hmm. of belief systems that you could pile these religious insurance policies on top of each other and still not feel safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have, do you have a, a, so today, obviously the, the different variable would be the internet and technology. Mm -hmm. uh, does that add any significant change or, or, or what would you have to say with regards to, to the technological angle to the, like, yeah. The fact that we worked out um, me basically, well, let me let me start here. The major differences that, between our society and, say, Roman society, is that our society is on a much bigger scale. We've got the advantage of fossil fuel energies. We've got the advantage of technologies that we design to use those energies to facilitate mass population growth. Um, mass, you know, we we can produce insane amounts of products, insane amounts of food, and things like that. And so we have. A population in the in the industrial world itself that is just gargantuan by the standards of Rome. Even you know, Rome itself, at its height, was a city of a couple of million people. It was huge by the standards of the day. Um, try comparing it to the big cities of the modern world or to the urban areas that just stretch on for miles and miles and miles. Yeah, we have that many people. We have an industrial system designed to enable them to function and to get food, to get product. We have the communication system that enables them to function the way that Romans did walking down to the forum and getting in conversations there. And so the, this is one of those places where technology is a trailing indicator. It's simply our workaround, our kludge that we use to act like an, an ordinary human society, even though there are 7 billion of us. So the internet as I see, it doesn't really add anything other than the capacity for for, um, for increased number. And since we've got the increased number anyway, we kind of need that. Would you say that this cycle from mm -hmm. abstraction to, <clears throat> to concreteness, back to abstraction and so on, is something exclusive to the era of civilization, the last 10,000 years? Well, we don't know. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if if um, if human societies twenty thousand years ago had left writing, we might be able to tell. 
but as yeah. it is, we're very sharply limited by what we what we can figure out. We do know that societies rose and fell before there was writing. Um, the the civilization or the society we don't, we don't call it civilization. The society that built Stonehenge followed the yes. normal course of rise and fall over about a thousand years. What happened during that time? What complexities led them through that curve? We have no idea. Because, again, all we have is the mute evidence of, of archaeology. Mm -hmm. If somebody back then had written things down, we could you know, dig up inscriptions from the guys who built Stonehenge and said, wow, so that's – then we might have some clue. My own guess is that it's probably common to any human society of any complexity at all. But that's a guess. I see. What would be the relationship between – this 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 perhaps this cycle uh and the religious institutions of of their age you mentioned before that the mm -hmm. concrete is the realm of the religious but i'm thinking mm -hmm. you know it, uh, is there i'm thinking i'm thinking about the, the 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 big religious events or spiritual events of every age uh mm -hmm. the great sort of either the prophets or the great rebellions mm -hmm. against the previous paradigm Mm -hmm. And try to square that with with the cycle. So you know, when yeah. Martin Luther <clears throat> put his, you know, put his pamphlets on the on the church mm -hmm. door, mm -hmm. might he have accelerated that cycle? Might he have? Did that represent sort of a turning point? Uh, I see. I see it as I see it as simply one of the usual phases, just as in ancient Greek times there was a lot of religious turbulence um, as, the, as the old worship of the, of the gods began to lose uh, the, the sort of enthusiastic support of the intellectual classes. You had people, they weren't nailing, nailing um, theses to doors, but you had a lot of people in, among the pre-Socratic philosophers, for example, who were um, arguing with the traditional notions of religion. You have um, Plato in the Republic saying that poets are going to be barred from the, um, you know, from his Republic because they tell lies about the gods and things like this. It's very much the same spirit. And you can find that again in every civilization as it's hitting, as it's reaching the beginnings of its age of reason. The first thing it does with its, with these new reasoning capacities is look at its traditional religion. And so Martin Luther is part of the process that gives rise to Descartes, that gives rise to the rise of European rationalism, the rise of science, and so on, just as his equivalents in ancient Greece were part of the process that led to the rise of Greek philosophy, the rise of Greek rationalism, the rise of, of logic and mathematics, and so on. Um, you get similar figures in the history of ancient Egypt, um, Akhenaten. It's kind of the Martin Luther is time. He was fortunate enough to be Pharaoh, although it didn't, you know. But it's it's the same kind of spirit. Equally, I'm thinking in Chinese um, society, you have Confucius, who was saying, "Well, yes, it's very it's very important to do these these traditional rituals, but the the you know the superior man doesn't take them seriously." <laughs> and so, so uh, just a very. Quick follow up. So you would say then that today we are at that crest moving from the era of abstraction to an era perhaps of more concreteness? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Basically, the age, the age of reason in Europe began, um, say, sometime between 50, 1550 and 1650. The age of reason is ending in our time. And what we have now is an a, is the age of transition, the long downslope. Um, of increasing increasing religiosity, um, increasing um, superstition, and in the in the full meaning of that word, the the bring the holding over of, of old traditions that have lost their meaning, um, rationalism on the defensive, um, political systems breaking down because nobody actually believes the rhetoric that they're founded on, all this kind of stuff is is very standard. So we are on we are in that downward slope that will eventually end in a new dark age. This emergence of, of like return to religiosity is very interesting. Mm -hmm. like I'm seeing at the moment, I'm quite involved with, we've got here in Europe, European, uh, European men's movement. And there's a lot mm -hmm. of guys turning to Orthodox Christianity. Mm -hmm. I think in the wake of the whole thing that happened with Jordan Peterson. Now, I'm mm -hmm. not a massive Christian myself. I, uh, mm -hmm. I came up through the world of heavy metal. I think I've always been into <laughs> my, uh, like mm -hmm. my pagan symbols and the devil and uh, and lust and sexuality than uh, mm -hmm. 
and churches and crucified uh, Jesuses. But yeah, it's definitely there. It's it's definitely happening. Mm-hmm. And then there's also it's, like, oh, go on. No, no, that doesn't surprise me at all because, um, unfortunately, for the you know for its survival, the Catholic Church has basically sold out to the modernists, and that leaves the Orthodox Church as very nearly the only um, bastion of traditional Christianity in the world. So I'm not at all surprised that that, that it's getting that kind of enthusiasm in Europe. Uh, I know people in on this side of the water who have gone very deeply into the Orthodox Church. Mm. And one of the ideas that's being thrown around amongst those guys, at least, there's a sense that orthodoxy is somehow more masculine than uh, than catholicism or protestantism hmm. like i don't i don't really know orthodoxy well but i've heard them say that their vision or the image of jesus is more christus mm-hmm. victor than this christus mm-hmm. it's like the sufferer there's a bit christus, more of a uh, christus patience yeah mm-hmm. yes yes, the, yes yes that's it now the in, the interesting thing is it didn't it didn't always used to be that way and um but but one can understand over and above the image, the imagistic things, there is, in, you know, the the Catholic Church has largely surrendered to the modernist movement at this point. The recent movement to try to ban the um, the Latin Mass, when that's what what an enormous number of people um, actually want. No, no, no! You've got to take our watered down, um, vul, you know, Latin Mass in in the Vulgate languages and and like it, says the Pope, and. <laughs> It's just it's it's embarrassing to watch to watch an institution that could actually stand for something, um, just you know lying down and and embracing the sort of modernist ideology at the very moment that the modernist ideology is cracking open through its own weakness. Um, that it's it's very interesting that we usually see Pope Francis mentioned in the same pantheon as Greta Thunberg, Nelson Mandela, <laughs> and all of these. <laughs> And Bono, poor, you know what I mean? That poor, that poor kid. I, I'm <sighs> really sorry that she never had the chance to have a childhood, that she ended up be, becoming a trained monkey on a stage, but you know, perform, um, you know, performing ape, dancing around to her parents' tune. Um, what a miserable yeah. way to grow up. <laughs> yeah. What, what, uh-huh. what, so so I, I, I do agree with you. And uh, so, you know, Owen mentioned Orthodox Christianity uh, in, in a couple of, of uh, perhaps smallish movements, but, but generally speaking, looking at the trajectory of the current globalized Western Western led civilization, what religions do you see emerging, or what uh, you know, in this new age of concreteness? Yeah. Okay. Well, the first thing to keep in mind is we don't know yet. Um, if if the if we were having a conversation in Athens, let's say in the sense, second century AD, you know, we're sitting here a little ways off the agora. And people are going past and talking. We're talking, okay, yeah, you know, the, the Roman world is, is in contraction. This is happening to its traditional ideas. Which religion do you think is going to become the major religious form? The thought that it was the, this little Christian sect, people would have said, that's nuts. They're a bunch of crazies. They're, they're only of interest to slaves and women. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, it's essentially impossible to judge simply because... Oh. Our attitudes, our ideas, our entire vision of the world is shaped by our own culture, by our own civilization, the cycle that we are part of. To see the new one requires a leap of consciousness that I don't think human minds are capable of doing. So it simply takes – it's going to take shape of itself, guided by, you know, by events rather than by individuals deciding. We have no idea. Right now, the great religious movement of of you know twenty fourth twenty fifth century Europe um, could consist right now of a little group of people around a charismatic teacher in Sicily, or it could consist of um, some you know some kid who's having strange dreams in Novosibirsk. <laughs> we don't know. It's, we do know that the ferment is beginning. The new religions are beginning to emerge. New ways of looking at the world are taking shape. We've had the rise and fall of the neo-pagan movement, which was, uh, frankly, too, too closely latched into the existing order of things. But it opened up a space of possibility that other movements are starting to go into. We also have attempts to redefine and rethink existing religious forms. That's a very important process. Um, Judaism 
before the basically Judaism and the classical world and Judaism today are almost are, are two almost completely different religions because Judaism rethought itself and it reworked itself for the next the, the next historic cycle in the same way it's quite possible that some form of Christianity could buckle down and rethink itself and adapt over mm-hmm. time to the concerns that will make the that will make the next great cycle of civilization um, this what is, it yes. will be. This is extremely interesting. I want to throw something to, to the table. So mm-hmm. though, though we may not know, obviously, uh, in, uh, you know, now what those religious forms will be, uh, mm-hmm. one of the ideas that I've been interested about has been the newosphere and this idea that in the sphere of mind, especially in the age of networked mind through technology, mm-hmm. that you know, it is as if there was a field of memes that is volatile, and that mm-hmm. governs itself not by the laws of coherence and, and the laws of cause and effect, but rather via the rhetoric of dream, of magic, of mm-hmm. intuition, mm-hmm. of creativity, of apophenia, yeah. et cetera. So, uh, what, yeah, what you're talking yeah. about is what occultists call the astral plane. Precisely. Uh, and it, it so happens that just now it has a slightly more obvious um, material component in terms of computer memes and so on. But Precisely. Yeah. 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 And, and so... Alexander Dugin, this this Russian thinker, um, mm-hmm. he, he speaks about Nuomahia as the, the idea that there is a war going on in this astral plane, or at least I would rephrase it as saying that there's a competition uh, between the memes, the memes that govern and through which we perceive. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that competition is happening. It's it's part of, obviously, mm-hmm. maybe the culture wars. And they're always a war. Uh, that It is what it is. In terms of like which one is the dominant, which one isn't, and you mentioned that Judaism reinvented itself, and I, I, mm-hmm. I just want to latch onto that a little bit because this act, how did it reinvent itself? Like one of the one of the ways through which it did that, not obviously not the only one, was was the interpretive interpretative tradition of the Torah mm-hmm. that is the Kabbalah. So. Yeah. These these mystics would continually pour over these pages, pour mm-hmm. over these memes, find new combinations, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and that's a divinatory mm-hmm. act. That's that's divination. Um, oh yes, yeah, yeah. That's fascinating and, to me because and it and, like, be, yeah. and even before the Kabbalah got going, you had the process of the creation of the Talmud. After the destruction of the Second Temple, you had all of these people trying to make sense of a set of traditions that no longer could be applied in everyday life. Because there was no temple, there was no the the whole central theme of Jewish tradition up to that point didn't exist anymore. So what do you do? You reinvent. You dream. You use vision. You use commentary. You use discussion. You generate memes and see whether they get. And so yeah, you have this development of a completely new framework within the within the structure or within the images and the and the core notions of the old. That's one of the things. One of the things that I that I would not be at all surprised. Obviously, I won't live to see it. Um, Oswald Schwenkler used to think that um, one of the next great civilizations would emerge in what's now European Russia, and that's interesting. Interestingly, that's something that a lot of people in the occult community back in the 19th and early 20th century also held. And what I see happening in terms of this war that Dugan is talking about is the process whereby, through competition, through struggle, through contemplation and vision, a complete reworking of Christianity is taking place to give rise to what will be the core religious vision of a future Russian great, great civilization. Wow. And it's remarkable that's, that... That's what, that's what Steiner thought. Or no, uh, uh, come on. Rudolf Oh, not, not Rudolf Steiner, yeah. Oswald Spengler. I okay. to, yeah, um, not quite the same thing, although <laughs> yeah. not as different as you might think. <laughs> Interesting, because uh, it, it, it's remarkable also that Dugan is very connected to uh, spirituality, chaos magic. He's, he's an occultist. He knows what he's talking about. Uh, Good heavens, I, I, did, I did not know that. Okay, that's, I'm not even completely. surprised. Well, I've been, I have not read a lot of I've, I've read just scraps of Dugan at this point. Yeah, that's yeah. fascinating. Okay. It's, it's fascinating. And one of the things that I, we, in our podcast with him, uh, we even tried to sort of suss out of him was uh, sort of a, I, I get these intimations that he knows uh, he's magically very savvy and aware of what he's doing, but mm. he disguises himself as a political agent. And in fact, he's an agent, a, 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 a less, well, first an agent, I would say a, a person with a, with an agenda. 
and only mm-hmm. secondly, a philosopher. And one of the things mm-hmm. that in one of his books he mentions that really caught my attention was that he was talking that in the future we'll be talking about a political angeliology. Mm-hmm. So that the struggle is really between these these egregores uh, that are these these, mm-hmm. these massive uh, ideologies, mm-hmm. these flows, mm-hmm. and he's clearly playing that game. And in my view, oh, yeah. to play the game at that level, mm-hmm. it, you know, is 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 how you win all the other downstream games. They say that politics well, is downstream it, from culture. Yeah, uh, and imagine and and culture is downstream from the imagination. Yes, profoundly. Um, yeah, the the thing the thing to keep in mind, and and this is, uh, I, as if he's a chaos magician, he may not get this because it's one of the great blind spots in chaos magic. Human beings are not the only players in this game. Mm-hmm. You want to call the other players archetypes. If you want to be Jungian, you want to be old fashioned and call them gods. You want yeah. to call them, um, you know, self generating centers of consciousness and, and meaning. I could, we could trot out a dozen different labels for them, but they exist. They're real, and they're more they're more powerful than human beings. Absolutely. And so, to a very important extent, one of the reason one of the things I discussed in my book, uh, The King in Orange, is the way that. Um, the, the, chaos, the chaos magic movement that supported Donald Trump was kind of picked up and moved, not by people, but by something else, Profoundly, by a yes. pattern that I discussed in the book in terms of archetypes. There are many other languages we could use. In the same way, what I see happening in, um, in Russia right now is the emergence of archetypal forces that have their own agenda. And if Alexander Dugin is, um, is attuned to those, whether he knows it or not, he may, you know, he may succeed to a very great degree, and if he is not attuned to them, they'll brush him aside. What are these 100%. forces you think of rising up there? Are they old Russo-European gods that have been laid dormant for a long time? Um, if they are, they've taken on new forms because God, you know, gods die and are reborn all the time, but it's never quite the same god. <laughs> um, the Jesus we have, the Jesuses, I should say, the the Jesi. Um, we have over here, and that's, that, that there's a running that, that what we have for some reason a preponderance over here of goofy pseudo religions that make an enormous amount of common sense. There's the Discordian religion that some people have heard of, mm-hmm. which worships Eris, the god of chaos. There's also the Church of the Subgenius, and if you want to guess, you want to tell me what they worship, I, I'd, be, I'd be welcome. But they're cra- they're crazed. One of their things, though, is that we suffer from the plague of false Jesi. That's a Texas plural of Jesus. And, and I, think, I think in some sense, they're right. There are all of these different archetypes, images, concrete patterns that all go under the name of Jesus, and they're not the same. The European Jesus and the American Southern Baptist Jesus and the American liberal, you know, liberal Christian Protestant Jesus and the various Catholic Jesus, they're all in competition with each other. They're not the same gods. In the same way, it would not surprise me at all if what we have emerging in Russia is is a genuinely Russian Jesus. Wow. But it might also be something that draws on the old Slavic gods, that draws on Perun and so on. Um, We don't know that much about that realm. Um, It is entirely possible that... Since we have, since our brains are only six inches long, we may not be smart enough to know a lot about that realm. But certainly, powers emerge. Sometimes they echo older powers. What is the power of this Jesus image? Then this, like, man, long hair, kind of beautiful, dies brutally when he's young. Like, there's something quite Dionysian about it, right? It reminds me of Dionysus. Oh, oh, very much so. Oh, that's that's what, one of the things that Christianity capitalized on is that the number of dying gods, who all more or less looked the same, in in late classical, you had Adonis, you had Attis, you know, all, all of these, um, and 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 Dionysus was one of them, you know, he depending on which myth you read, uh, and so yeah, that's the the the, be, the beautiful young man, um, cruelly sacrificed was a very powerful image in the, in the ancient Mediterranean. You then go into the old, um, old Northern and Western European versions, and you get things like the Heliand, where, where Jesus is presented as a war leader and his apostles or his band of warriors with whom he is, he is vanquishing um, the hosts of Satan by sacrificing himself practically on the world tree, like Odin. Mm-hmm. So it's a different Jesus altogether. And 
you, you just have, you, there's there's a lot of variation between do we have the very feminine gentle Jesus meek and mild blah. Uh, do we have the carpenter from Nazareth who was probably built like most carpenters um, flogging the the you know the the tradesmen out of the temple what do we have um, as with every set of religious imagery it's it's contested. It's not uniform. It's not co- consistent or coherent because its mm-hmm. logic is not. It's not a human logic. Its logic is not a mental yes. logic. It's a logic of that astral realm, of the emotional, of the imagistic, of the of the mimetic. So, so it, when it comes to the emergence of the new face of this mm-hmm. God with a thousand faces that you see mm-hmm. in Russia, or mm-hmm. perhaps. I want to, you know, go back to, to you mentioned a while ago with the emergence of Donald Trump that there were forces making themselves felt and uh, rearranging oh, yeah. the affairs of men so as to serve their own purposes. And I, I want to ask you a specific magical question, which is more like, mm-hmm. um, you know, the story of Peppa the Frog. And I was actually literally on 4chan when that stuff happened, so I, I, I got the goosebumps. Okay. I got the goosebumps when that happened. Why? Uh-huh. Because, and it is my theory. That's what I want to sort of run by you. Uh, that the stringing together of a couple coincidences three four mm-hmm. five coincidences together is precisely how you shift say a reality mm-hmm. tunnel and the, the robert mm-hmm. Anderson wilson concept and yeah. you shift mm-hmm. it and you, you you sort of create a new belief system within it so when you have yeah. one coincidence wow maybe the numbers you know huh, what is this then you have two three four five then yeah, people the will gets, have the goosebumps the, that, yeah the gets pile up and all of a sudden something that is not just it's no longer just a bunch of random people scattered around the internet. There's a group mind. There's a group yes. consciousness. And it's central. And it, by some theories, it's what's generating the coincidences. Yes. As the group mind comes together, as it becomes influenced by this particular pattern of, of Pepe the Frog and Keck the Egyptian God and, and Chatelet and the whole nine yards. Yes, I was lurking um, at intervals during all that whole, all that, that, entertaining mm-hmm. process what a what a classic classic example of divine forces archetypal forces call them what you want manifesting in human affairs yeah. and then walking away Completely. because after, once trump got into office do you did you notice how fast things dried up completely and yeah. it, it, and it's also interesting uh, to make the parallel with mm-hmm the emergence of, of, of Nazism and with mm-hmm. how in many ways that was a little burst as well of of sort of rapport with other entities like magic. Oh, yeah. The, right? Yeah. It was a it was a different it was a different entity. And so it had a different trajectory and a different endpoint. But right. um, Jung's Jung's essay Votan is required right. reading in this. There is oh. another book, I forget I forget the name of the author. She was a psychoanalyst, she was active in Germany in the nineteen twenties and early nineteen thirties, fled obviously at the time of the Nazi takeover, or shortly thereafter. And the book was titled Third Reich of Dreams. Because what she noticed is that over the course of the twenties and early thirties all of her patients, including Jewish patients, she was herself Jewish, were having these dreams over and over again where Adolf Hitler was such a nice man. Wow. And where they had dreams where they were dressing up in Nazi uniforms and things. And so there was this suction going on on the dream level. Wow. Yeah, the the, is, your uh, reaction was, that was exactly how I reacted when I read about this thing. And then I got the book and was going... Holy crap. Okay. So, yeah, think forces were moving. They were moving in a particular direction. And, of course, since it was, it was the energy of, of, of Votan, of course it ended in Gotenama. It always does. <laughs> when you have a myth of Votan, you end up with, with you know, flames rising over Valhalla. That's just, you get used to it. <laughs> if you want a different end point, invoke a different day. Like a different entity. So, Exactly, yeah. And so, um, <clears throat> so yeah, uh, um, it, it is another one to look at. And, and, and there are others. If you, if you go back, go back through, through a lot of recent history, look for the places where the, where the transrational breaks through and things get really weird for a while. I can imagine how this works in the world of technology uh, because my only, 
no, in our time, perhaps the only two great, uh, I don't know, this is too, too, too wide a statement to make, but I, I want to trace a relationship between these large uh, events that happen in the perceptions of the masses and mm -hmm. media communication technologies. 9-11 happened because it was televised. Otherwise, it wouldn't mm -hmm. have happened. Otherwise, it, it would not have affected. It, it would have affected people. Oh, wow. How, how horrible. End of story. Yeah, it was, yes. Yeah, you read about it. That, that's it. You read uh, about it. You know, Peppa the Frog is, 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 is the internet. It's, it's Facebook. It's 4chan as mm -hmm. the anonymous Ouija board that facilitated mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm. But then looking back through history with different mm -hmm. media technologies, I find it uh, a little bit harder to imagine how it might have come to pass. So I don't know if you, if you have any, any insights on that. Oh, no, let's, okay, let's, let's take some examples. One of the great examples that I have in mind is what happened in the late 1960s, especially but not only in the United States, where you had this manifestation of Dionysus, basically of Dionysian energy. You had all of these young people who were raised to be, to put on business suits and, and go to work in corporations, all of a sudden for a period of about half a dozen years, we're dancing around stark naked in body paint um, <laughs> to rock music. And then it went away and they all shook themselves and went, wow, what the heck was I thinking? And put on the business suits and went to work for the corporations. That was also mediated by technology. The technology that it was mediated by was primarily broadcast radio and the record player. Yes. And, and uh, mm -hmm. what, another example that this brings to mind, in an era before modern electric paradigm media communication mm -hmm. technologies is, you know, I read at some point and you'll, I think you know this about a mass hysteria in medieval Europe where all the peasants just get together and start dancing for days, days on end. Yeah. 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 And, and there, the, the, the that's technology, Beatles without the Beatles. exactly. But it was the tech, the technology was word of mouth. Human beings can work any of these technologies because Tech, again, technology is not is not a creative thing. Technology is is downstream. Technology is, is downstream from the imagination. It's downstream from the psyche. Um, we imagine things, and then they take shape in machines. I think of, of um, Roger Bacon, the medieval philosopher, who th who was thinking of cars and submarines and airplanes. And talking mm -hmm. about these things, beginning the process whereby we imagined them into being. And so in the same way, yeah, Beatlemania without the Beatles, it, it happens. At, I mean, what happened in the collapse of the, French, of, of the French monarchy at the beginning of the French Revolution, try to make sense of that, where people are just sort of seized up in this, in this bizarre state. And eventually they come down after a lot of bodies have been, you know, and, and then they're in the hands of Napoleon and the bodies start mounting in a different way. But right. at, regular, at regular intervals in, in human affairs, you have these sudden outbursts of the transrational and things get really weird for a while. Remarkable. And maybe that's why the, the classic example of uh, when we look at the culture industry of, of the 20th century with, with the mm -hmm. connection between Crowley and Zeppelin and Black mm -hmm, Sabbath, mm -hmm. just the name tells mm -hmm, it all. Mm -hmm. And, you know, boys. and and mm -hmm. the, the, the absolute continuity of some of the symbols, maybe the migration oh, yeah. of some of the entities between the pre-45 era and the post-45 mm -hmm. era, you know, you know mm -hmm. one of the connections mm -hmm. that I make is like, who used to wear leather before 45? Hugo Boss wearing Nazis. Who started mm -hmm. wearing leather after 45? Well, rock and roll people. Uh, yeah. The connection is, is, is kind of a tangent. It's kind of a too creative, but, but there's a thing there, no? No, there's there's definitely something going on there because again there was there was a lot of occultism going on in the 1960s. I mean that was the beginning of the great modern occult revival. Um, interestingly, astrologers predicted it. Um, you can find copies in this country if you if you do some digging of a book called The Coming Great Golden Age of Occultism, which yes. argued that around the it was written in think of the 1930s, and in it predicted that in the 1960s, sometime in the 1960s, occultism would enter into this this really spectacular golden age. All kinds of books would be published. All kinds of teachers would be out there, and it happened. What are the sort of signals that? point, say, to someone in the 1930s, point them towards the 1960s being a golden age? Um, the, the book, as I read it, did the thing entirely on the basis of, astro of astrology. 
um, the guy was looking at various planet, configurations of the outer planets and so on, and also cycles through um, the, of, of interest in and lack of interest in occultism through American history and so on. And he said, here's the next one. Right. Wow. <laughs> Have we got any predictions on the cards? That, well, let me actually like throw an idea out there. Something I wonder uh -huh. about about the internet versus the broadcast era culture industry, mm -hmm. which had a massively centralizing effect on a lot mm -hmm. of the creative, artistic, mm -hmm. shamanic mm -hmm. talent, and. I think kind of sucks a lot of people up into this big machine and then <laughs> makes you very rich, pumps you full of drugs, pumps you full of money. And then great art comes out, but also these people who perhaps in a different age would have been wild occultists or wild musicians in mm -hmm. their local village end up being these global superstars pumped up with electricity and adrenaline mm -hmm. to, to a way that's mm -hmm. never really been possible before and i wonder if with the internet there's a mass decentralization again and what you're going to end up with is many more of these people who 60 70 years ago might have gone and become the beatles or mm -hmm. zeppelin being underground again and doing their work with a small community and that seems to well, me like very interesting and potentially yeah. wildly at, creative. at least for the moment that seems possible but keep in mind that one of the usual patterns in, in the history of technology is increased centralization. And it would not surprise me at all if we were to start, if we were not to start seeing increasing pressure towards centralizing the internet to bring it under central, centralized corporate control. I mean, okay. in the 1920s and 1930s, there were vastly more record labels than there were by the 1960s. By the 1960s, you had these handful of specialists, of, 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 rather of all purpose, record labels, this handful of mega companies that, that controlled the, the music industry. In the 1920s, when, when jazz was, was hot, for example, you didn't have that yet. And so there were lots of little producers, lots of, so there's this tendency to move towards centralization. Right yeah. now, we're in a period of diffusion. Um, what it's going to be like 30 years from now is another big question. That's interesting because we spoke to this military analyst called John Robb uh, mm -hmm. a few days ago, and he did mention the same thing. Uh, basically that we live in an era where the big tech giants are taking over, uh, they're going to centralize the internet and they have much larger prominence when it comes to irregular warfare campaigns than mm -hmm. the military itself has mm -hmm. at yeah. this point. Mm -hmm. and, and when I say military irregular warfare campaigns, my mind is also already going towards the occult, namely that mm -hmm. You know, Dugan and, for example, Vladislav Surkov, one of the guys who works with him and who's a theater, uh, you know, he's from the world of theater, postmodern mm -hmm. theater. He loves Ginsberg, Ginsberg and Tupac. I, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, my angle is that these players of the irregular warfare world, they know a lot about magic. And oh, they know yeah. the, the actual game they're actually playing. Yeah, the question is: To what extent do, do these folk, do these these um, focal places of great power remain in private hands? To what extent mm -hmm. do they end up being seized by governments? The fact that the so the, the Russia has tested sealing off its internet from the rest of the world, yeah, and the, and they're gearing up to that as a real possibility. I think, among other things, they've got that that gives them the capacity to fight uh, a manufactured color revolution very effectively. Yes. Yes. Uh, and I'm sure that's, that's part of what's in mind. But the other thing is that it allows them to um, checkmate the big tech companies just at any time they want to. And as that becomes more common, as you get more countries starting to break apart the Internet to limit um, how, much travel, how much traffic goes, between, goes across borders and so on, that can be done. And whether it ends up in private hands or whether it ends, there is a, you know, a government um, ministry of the Internet or whether mm -hmm. there is um, the kind of private corporation that's a wholly owned subsidiary of the, of the government – um, the way the, the phone company used to be here in the United States. Um, it's an interesting question, and yeah. it will probably vary from place to place. I'd say that the point at which any given nation decides to break away from the internet, basically mm -hmm. what would happen is the same that would happen if they decided to break away from the international banking system and financial system, <laughs> which is mm -hmm. you get invaded. A, a, That's a, 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 Yes, a revolution would be would be um, planned for them. 
the question is what happens when it's a nation like Russia, which has nukes? Yeah, R- Russia, yeah, the few nations that are actually kind of outside or outliers within that, they do certainly have the possibility to have their own unique egregores and, and somehow exactly. create a, a, and then, a multipolar and then other, Yes, and then other countries, especially now as the United States slides down its, its um, steepening curve of decline, um, other countries can start turning toward them and saying, we want your model. We do not want the United States. And I mean, that's happening. Hmm. We're, we're, kind of a we're, we're, watching, we're watching that happening in Afghanistan right now. Yeah. And I'm thinking of, yeah, as America pulls out, I'm thinking about Turkey as well. Uh, Afghanistan. Oh, yeah. Tur- Af- Afghanistan doesn't yeah. have that. Yeah. Afghanistan isn't that important, except as a place where you can send, to, where, you, where you can run um, petroleum pipelines through. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But uh, Turkey, Turkey is potentially a major power. Um, Plus they got the Turkey, egregore of the former Ottoman Empire. Exactly. Exactly. They've got that egregore. They've got a crucial place geopolitically. Um, they, they, there have been major empires in the Anatolian Peninsula since probably before the Hittites. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, you know, geopolitically, they've got an excellent position. And um, so, yeah, Tur- Turkey is very clearly laying the foundation to become a, a global power. And yes. they're also interested in none of the above. So it would be interesting to see how that plays out. Is it, what a, power shift more eastwards, right? I mean, like China's the mm-hmm. obvious one, but like we were just talking about Russia, there's Iran is starting to swing around as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, chi- China is, I, I have, if China can hold it together and, and deal with its internal problems, you know, China's been kind of the odds on favor to become the next great world power for a very long time. I occasionally wonder if they're going to be able to manage that because China has this tendency to fragment at intervals and the strains on, on the existing Chinese government are becoming increasingly harsh. So um, another country to keep a very close eye on is India. India has a huge industrial plant, a huge um, technology sector. It's becoming very culturally dominant. Bollywood films are shown everywhere these days. Um, it's got them. It's got the geopolitical position. It's got the military power. Um, in particular, if things get really crunchy in the years immediately ahead, an alliance between Russia and India would basically um, greatly outweigh the United States and its satellites. Mm-hmm. So we're, we are indeed moving towards this balkanization of the new sphere, this emergence oh, yeah. of the multipolar and, and, and world. And that's normal. That's normal. Um, in... You know, in 1890, the world was basically under the thumb of Britain. <laughs> you know, when when um, patriotic English people belted out, rule Britannia, Britannia rules the waves, it was a simple statement of fact. Okay. Mm-hmm. And not that much later, the British Empire had fallen to pieces. The United States was scrambling around trying to pick up some of them. The world was split down the middle. The, you know, things This was all incredibly fast. It happened very quickly. It happened very quickly. Um, you know, somebody who was somebody who was 20 years old when Britain was still the world's dominant power um, by 35 or 40 was living in a battered, bombed out mess of a country that still had rationing, that still had food rationing, what, 10 years after the end of the war. And all of this because somebody created an interface they become a tra- they became a transistor with the egregores doing their bidding because it's not really us humans pulling the strings. We yeah. get into covenants, yeah. and and that's yeah, kind somebody, of the yeah somebody aligned with us with a certain energy and away things went. And that's kind of like what I'm what I'd like to explore a little bit more. Like uh, from mm-hmm. your point of view, when it comes to this to to this, you know, what are the requirements? What are the key features? So we can say, you know, maybe an imaginary prophetic temperament, makeup, you know, even Jung said that, you know, compared to Mussolini, Hitler was a, a priest, a person void. It was a vessel, mm-hmm. whereas Mussolini was a typical bad guy, mm-hmm. you know, tough guy yeah. type boss, mm-hmm. whereas mm-hmm. Hitler was a prophet. He was a, he was a mediunic person. As a medium, yeah. medium you're a channeler. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, is, is that a requirement to interact with these new entities? Do you foresee them coming in? in the next decades and, and well, wrecking it, havoc? It depends on what you want to do. 
because there are many different ways to interact with that with these entities. There are ways that are more deliberate. There are ways that are more um, reflexive. Hitler, you know, Hitler Hitler put a lot of work into setting himself up as as the you know the ve- the vessel for the Wotan energy. Um, we know from some of the people who knew him in his Vienna years that he was up to his eyeballs in occult study. And, but yeah, he had he had that mediumistic temperament, and he was very much he was a very passive person in a certain sense, passive? and so he got passive. Yeah, he got scooped up by this energy, and right. then the energy flowed through him. And but it wasn't you know it wasn't Hitler who was doing it. <laughs> if you've watched if you've watched films of him um, giving the speeches. There are, there's this initial period where he's kind of fumbling, and then, then something seizes him. And he leans forward, and he seems to almost swell up a little bit. And then the flow starts. And, yeah. it, it's, it's, a, and it's, it's very mediumistic. It looks like a, a, a spiritualist medium getting taken over by her, cha- by, by her, her control. Yes. It is a possession. It got amplified pos- by, the te- by the technologies ex- of the radio. Exactly. And Exactly. But you can also do the same thing um, in a conscious manner and by choice. It's not, in some ways it's not as effective, in some ways it's more effective. One of the great examples that I use here is Dion Fortune, the English occultist, wow. um, because she, you know, her, she had some very specific goals. Um, one, of them, one of them, of course, was to preserve England against the Nazis. And mm. she, as, as, as I think most people know these days, she organized a mass magical working to basically with with the goal of preserving England um, through the battle of preserving Britain through the battle of Britain, and of course notice who won. I'm going to ask you something. Um, yeah. When it comes, for example, to the magical workings of Dion Fortune, given that perhaps what she did lived, and it, you know, lived in the in the, it didn't go outside this, her circle. It didn't have the power of mass media behind it. Because to me, m- magic that affects the masses is very easy to understand and accept when there's a force of a mass media technology behind it, mm-hmm. right? But when it's something done a little bit more in secret with maybe a handful of people in Glastonbury, then, then what's actually, what's actually okay. the effect? Like, is there- first of all, first of all, it wasn't just a handful of people. That's the thing. The war letters, that, that mm-hmm. had been that you'll find compiled in the book *The Magical Battle of Britain*. The war letters were circulated to every occult group in Britain. Everybody was getting these things and passing them on and having little working groups, and they were doing these coordinated workings. So you were having the equivalent of a mass media thing every week. These letters would go out all across England and Scotland and 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 Wales and Cornwall, and people would read them and do the meditations at the same time. So it was the same kind of effect as all these people listening to Hitler, but it wasn't something that the Nazis could tap into by just twisting their. Um, so it wasn't. You know, the, it the wasn't the radios. So it wasn't quantity of people being affected by this meme, but it was the quality. It, it's quality, yes. The thing is. An idea held by a small number of people who know how to concentrate and focus and work with it is far more powerful than an idea embraced passively by by the masses. Remarkable, because then the power of idea the of that specific idea uh, it, it just has a life on, of its own. Exactly. So there are basically two ways you can work mass magic. You can work it by treating people as passive passive recipients as, as puppets of your will, Hitler's way. Um, or you can you treat them as partners and say, here is the work, please join me. And as we saw in the 1940s, the latter actually is more effective. And, and the thing is, that's generally true. Um, it's, people, t- people tend to glorify the Nazis. And the Nazis succeeded. I mean, the Nazis succeeded in building their egregore to the point that nobody can look away from it. I mean, the, the Nazi party has been gone for how long now? And yet whenever anybody wants an image for the opposite of the modern world, they're magnetically drawn to that swastika. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Everybody yells about the Nazis. So, you know, they succeeded in yeah. that sense. They just um, 
crashed and burned and destroyed the nation. But they That's kind of become running. the founding myth of the new era, only wow. they were yeah. the vanquished nation <laughs> rather than the victorious yeah. nation, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even Kennedy said that, that Hitler is of the substance of which legends are made. And there's a oh, reason yeah. why Hitler is not mentioned in the same sentence as a Mussolini or a Gaddafi. It's not a warlord. Mm-hmm. He, he was a Muhammad that didn't happen. That's basically yeah. what happened. Well, what we don't know yet is what is going to happen, say, a thousand years from now. Because, um, um, you know, again, look at, look at Christianity. A um, hundred years after the death of Jesus, there was this, this tiny network of cultists that uh, nobody thought much of. So, you know, we have no idea. It, it, it is not impossible. Right. That a thousand years from now, Hitler will have been completely his 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 life, his his beliefs, his ideas will have been completely rewritten, and he will have been turned into the prophet of the gods know what. <laughs> this is the kind of thing that happens in history. If you look, if you compare myths to um, to what they turn into, you know you this have a you, yeah, you have a, a mi- you have a minor years. Roman you have a minor Roman British general fighting battles with the Saxons in the 6th sixth, in the, in the sixth century, in the 5th and 6th century in Britain, and out of that comes King Arthur. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the cool thing. Uh, like, when you talk about the dynamics in the newosphere, they do not rule themselves by the laws of man, of cause and effect, of logic, exactly. of, you know... Exactly. Of, of coherence, like, you know, one thing is one thing and not another. No, it's the law of dream, the rhetoric of dream, right? In a dream, exactly. a person is a person and also another person. So it's a complete uh, mm-hmm. schizoanalysis, it's complete schizophrenia in the world mm-hmm. of the new of ideas. So that's why we can't predict and, stuff. Yeah, exactly. And that's, wh- that's why I, I consistently say we have no idea what the next great religious forms are going to be. Um, all we can do is know that things are changing and try to get some sense of the direction. And that direction, by the way, will differ from place to place. One of the things that I think gets lost in so many attempts to imagine the future is the idea that the future is the same everywhere, and it isn't. Mm. So let me um, ask, oh, go sorry. Ahead. I was gonna no, ask, go ahead. So, so if we don't know what the future religious forms are gonna be, and yet <laughs> I think we're all in agreement that there's going to be future religious forms. Oh yeah. As people involved in trying to craft and be plugged into these new forms in a way mm-hmm. that is non-destructive, constructive, mm-hmm. really. I want beauty, I want fucking, I want to build stuff. Like, what mm-hmm. are the kind of principles that you know of for doing this well? Um, okay, all I can do is talk, is talk from my own experience and from what I've seen other people try and not try. Um, and what has worked and what has not worked. And the first thing that I have to say is that most of the people who try to do this don't have adequate training. Mm. And I, I have known so many people who have launched into this idea, they're going to they're gonna get involved in magical this or religious that, and they literally haven't done, they haven't even waded in the kiddie pool yet. They have no clue how, how magic works, how spirituality works. They've never done it so the first thing to do is get yourself some basic training um fortunately right now that's easier than it's ever been before in history um if somebody wants to get um the fundamental training in the golden dawn system of magic where i had my original training for example um it's easy it's all out there in books um there there are people on the you know their their youtube videos walking you through the some of the rituals and this kind of stuff but you've got to get that basic training you've got to know what you're doing and again this was one of the things that gave Dion fortune her edge because she was working in a british occult scene where people had been up to their eyeballs in ceremonial magic for the last 50 years so there was a lot of expertise available um the Nazis did not have that advantage because they had, um, I mean, they had their own, their own sort of core of skilled people, but they had been going around trying to get rid of every other rival occult organization in Britain, or in Germany, rather. And so they, they couldn't call on that pool of skill. So first thing to do is learn how to do it. Get the training. So you learn, you know, get the experience so you know what to do. And the second thing is then listen as much as you talk. 
and just as just as I think um, the major reason why one of the major reasons why Christian religion is in, dif- is in such difficulty these days is that so many people think of praying as talking to their God, and not enough of them think of it as praying as listening for a change. You need to learn to listen to the to the, the, the what you're calling the noosphere. You need to listen to it and attend to it, learn its tides and patterns. That can be done through dreams. It can be done through various kinds of, of um, metaphysical experience, through clairvoyance, uh, just the act of imagination. There are all kinds of different ways of doing it. But you've got to be able to listen. You've got to be able to tune in and pay attention and go, I think I see how things are flowing. And then you go with that. And you may be wrong. No guarantees in this business. But... It seems to be worth trying, and it seems to work better than, than just deciding, well, I, I have no idea what I'm doing, and I'm not paying attention to the newosphere at all, but I know what I want to have happen. I'm going to make it happen. <clears throat> there is a book. I've forgotten the author's name, but the title is The Way. It is a book. Uh, it was intended to be the founding document. Edward Goldsmith is the author. The founding document of a new ecological religion. It's been sitting, gathering dust on bookshelves. It's got very well, very nice reviews, but it's been gathering dust on bookshelves for decades since it came out in the 1980s. Because Goldsmith, you know, came up with this this ecological theology and philosophy and blah de blah de blah. But you can tell from page one that he doesn't actually believe it in a spiritual sense. It's just an ideology to him. He doesn't actually feel a connection to the newosphere, to the spiritual powers in it. He postulates one because he wants people to believe it. But he's not a prophet. He's not, he's not a mage. He's not in tune with these things. And so it, it sits there dead on the shelf. Lots of the attempts to tune into or to to move things in this direction or that suffer from that problem. Mm -hmm. I want to throw something to you, which is I'm very interested in my own practice in Mm -hmm. figuring out a, I'm a designer by craft and by trade, and that's what I do. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, if I had to very succinctly say what is my pursuit is to establish a modality of design Mm-hmm. that is uh, not foolish with regards to magic, but not explicitly. Mm-hmm. It's not something mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. explicitly said to be, oh no, we're doing magic because that throws people off. But in, in you know, and Alistair Crowley, when he's putting together, you know, some of his own mm, things, he's very syncretistic. He goes and mm-hmm. picks and chooses from everywhere, from all rituals, mm-hmm. from all traditions, so mm-hmm. as to make things work. And I find that that's an interesting method of collage not mm-hmm. only not to produce a, an ideology that yo guys here's how you have to believe here's how you have to emote mm-hmm. but rather what i'm interested in is creating a mm-hmm. framework a method mm-hmm. a tool set um mm-hmm. which <clears throat> has the purpose that that magic has which is mm-hmm. the alteration of of consciousness and making oneself open to to the interventions mm-hmm. and to to conversing the guardian yeah. angels of the newest fear that we see on memes every day on Instagram and whatever. Yeah. In, in, in other words, practicing magic without calling it magic so you don't freak people out. Yeah. And without uh, using, as as without using yeah, and without using, using big flashing neon saying, signs saying, hi, this is magic pentagrams and things like that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, that bridges and that, us that's to the worlds of, 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 of advanced technology, but please do go on, sorry. Yeah, no, but that's, that, that's certainly one way to do it. Um, and it's it's a way that has been very has been done very effectively, um, sometimes in a very corrupt fashion. If you look at a lot of a lot of advertising today, it's, it's very clear that the people who are doing it know something about yeah, the art and yeah. science of causing yeah. change in consciousness in accordance with will. But of course, what they want to do with that is to make people stupid. And get money. All adver- all adver- exactly all advertising has the purpose of making you stupid, so you will spend money on something you don't actually want. If you actually want something, you don't need an ad to tell you you want it. You just go and buy it. Yes. So one of the things that, that, we, that is central to the increasing stupidity of modern life is precisely the saturation with advertising. These are spells to make people morons. Yes. I would say, however, that the fault in that case is not so much on the magical craft that is practiced mm-hmm. by these Madison Avenue types, but the fault is rather, uh, it's not on the magic. It's not the tool that's wrong. It's actually the, the way they're using it. Yeah, it's how it's, it's how it's being used. You yeah. could the, the, there is there is, however, an issue here because 
if you're going to do mass magic in that kind of way, trying to make people passive and make them do what you want, you're kind of stuck making them stupid. Yes. Because people, the more you inspire people to think, the less predictable they're going to become. So Very to good. some extent, they're tools. The, the, it's not merely the, 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 the broad sort of structure, but the, the narrow structure of their tools, how they're doing this, how they're doing that, has all been rather specialized for making people dumb. Hundred uh, percent. That's why when you're making a cult, it generally just attracts boring people, uh, as my exactly. friend Alexander Bard says. And so, uh, I, one of the interesting connections that I drew and that I want to throw to you to hear your thoughts is a connection between Alistair Crowley's Tables of Correspondence in Libra Seven 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 and the way that he creates this massive grammar of correspondences between sense and sounds and symbols and gods and mm -hmm. letters and astrological mm -hmm. elements. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, I understand where he's coming at. He's trying to get people to produce emotion internally in a similar way so as to access the same entities, perhaps very particular to his snapshot in time. However, my feeling is that this is extremely cumbersome and the entities mm -hmm. that I'm accessing, uh, you know, we have Instagram, you know, the world has changed so that those tables of correspondence have kind of become obsolete. There has occurred a symbolic deflation mm -hmm. as, oh, as you, such, you, could, you know, when you, when you go yeah. to these, mm -hmm. uh, so, so, sorry. So when I go to, for example, I went to Glastonbury a couple of years ago to this occult conference. And, and one of the things that I noticed is like, yo, these pentagrams don't hit because I see more images in one hour than my ancestors would see in their whole lives almost, but because I have the, the internet disconnection. And so it's just, it's not a change of paradigm. It's just kind of an adaptation to the, to the, to the conditions. Mm -hmm. All that I'm saying is that the techniques of magic today, uh, rather techno magic, or, you know, if the goal of the students who's studying these tables of correspondence is to learn them, is to imprint them in his own attention, then if he's doing that in 2021, he might as well employ AI to help him, to help uh, condition his, well, his perception. Well, perhaps. I don't know. My, the, I, I, have to, I have to speak to, to this from my own experience. I did not use mm -hmm. Crowley's version. I, I did classic Golden Dawn for my training. Mm -hmm. I, didn't find, I, I do not find Crowley especially appealing. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I did, the, I did the classic Golden Dawn, which is some, with the somewhat less ornate set of correspondences, but it's still all the correspondences. It's as much the way you're shaping your own consciousness. You're not, not just imprinting it, but learning certain skills of thinking with images and so on, which do not necessarily come naturally if you're raised in a very abstract conceptual con uh, society like ours. And it was very much worth doing. And it, I, I did it, you know, I, I have Asperger's syndrome. I tend, to be very, I tend to be a little rigid about things like that, and I tend to be a little obsessive about things like that. And so I piled into the Golden Dawn, you know, as per Regardi's, um, you know, big lumpy mm -hmm. tome, and did it cover to cover and got an enormous amount out of it. So you can use that. You may choose to do something else. But the mere fact that, there, that Instagram is out there does not make these things, it may make them unfashionable. Right. And it may make, mean that you have a little more work ahead of you, and there may be other ways that you choose to do it instead, right. but they still work just fine. Yes, yes, yes. yes. You're right. If you're willing to put the kind of effort into them that everyone put into them in, say, 1900, mm -hmm. um, be, because you were, you, know, you were expected to spend months at a time learning each of, this, each of the um, knowledge lectures and doing this and doing that and getting that training down. And if you do that, you, you, know, you will still get the reaction I assume, or the same responses, I assume, not having done the the Crowley thing, I assume that if you, you know, if you do the OTO trip, you will get the same effects. Yeah, I agree with you. You're correct. Would you say that the entities remain the same throughout the ages? That's a really good question. Um, a lot of Renaissance books of magic said that um, any table of spirits more than forty years old is useless. <laughs> Because the spirit, because spirits are not static, they're constantly changing, and so the usual teaching in a lot of these books was um, forget about you know the, the sort of pop culture grimoires of the day. Your point, your goal is to make contact with your guardian genius or holy guardian angel, what have you, and then receive from him or her the necessary tables of spirits. And once you have those, then you have spirits you can invoke. Da da da. That always struck me as the more sensible idea. 
Um, because no, there's no reason to think that the world, of, that the world of spheres, that the new of spheres, is static. There's no reason to think that the, the world of gods Much is static. We know, we know, looking looking back at the history of religion, that gods, gods and goddesses rise and fall. Yeah, they become more Much important. The they become less important. Yeah, that's where I I look at philosophers like Gilles Deleuze, and I also look in the same breath to people like uh, Swedenborg. And I mm -hmm. see people who are doing not to not those not things that are not too dissimilar, uh, mm -hmm. and people might find this weird, but I find these you know especially you know Swedenborg was obviously uh, working with revelation and esoteric Christianity mm -hmm. and, and this so so sure magic okay, mm -hmm. but if I look at a Deleuze, what he speaks about with schizoanalysis, with the production of lines of flight, with mm -hmm. instantiating potentials from the imminent. Uh, mm -hmm. What I hear when I read Deleuze is these echoes of occult practices reinvented mm -hmm. in philosophy in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I think I, I feel some, some common refrain, some common practice, some common verbs. Oh, it, it makes perfect sense. And in both cases, as far as we know, Swedenborg didn't actually have any occult training he suddenly started you know he's like 50 years old and he suddenly started yeah. suddenly started having visions. visions and in the same way i don't I, I do not follow Deleuze. i find that most of most of continental philosophy um kind of post nietzsche is mm -hmm. might as well be written in in old high gibberish as far as i'm concerned it does mm -hmm. not i i'm i'm very nietzsche uh, Sch Sch nietzsche and schopenhauer are about as late as i go i, I do i do read the existentialists but um I find them suitable to my needs, but yes. um, I, do, I have never heard anyone claim that Deleuze had um, systematic occult training. So, you know, his his delving into the borderlands of schizophrenia seemed to have had the same effect. Yes, yes. As 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 Schwedenborg's experience of visions, and and understandably, if there is a non-physical reality, if there is a reality outside of the realm of concrete dense matter, then it's there. And thus, and thus the connection. Yeah, exactly. And they're actually reporting on the same thing. And it, you know, if, if, if you travel, if you go to Japan, and if I go to Japan, um, our, our experiences are going to have certain things very noticeably in common. And in the same way, if Deleuze starts um, you know, perceiving the astral plane and Schwedenborg starts perceiving the astral plane, again, their experiences are going to have something in common. Yeah. However, yeah. it does lead Deleuze to jump out of a window and end his life. Yes, <laughs> yes, that, that to me is like... Mm -hmm. but let me ask you something about plagues, given that we've been in the year of the plague. <laughs> the year of the virus panic, yes. Yes, yeah, yes. What does occultism have to tell us about... Okay, there are a couple of things going on here. There are several things. First of all, epidemic disease is routine. It is a normal part of, of life and we have had a mild decrease in those in, in recent decades. We had a little bit of a, of a breather from those. But, I mean, if you look back to the, the, the influenza epidemic of 19, what was it, 1956, 1957, um, the death toll was um, a, per capita about the same as the, the coronavirus has had. And of course, there were about a quarter as many people on the planet, but there were about a quarter as many deaths. Um, the Spanish flu uh, killed 20 million people. <laughs> and these things happen on a routine basis. So on the one hand, we need to accept that this is a normal part of life on Earth. Okay, second level. According to a number of occult traditions dating back a fair ways, what, happen, what epidemics do is that um, well, they're, they're one of several things that clear away um, collective imbalances. People, societies, species will get caught up in some kind of head trip. And it will discharge in the form of a, of, a, of a plague or some other disaster. And this is kind of what gets moralized and symbolized and personified in the sort of religious idea of the god going, you, die. <laughs> mm. um, and, but in this case, also, there's something else going on because the, the coronavirus is not that dangerous. Again, it's right up per capita. It's about the same as a bad flu epidemic. But it has become this lightning rod for terrors 
that I think, and I think a lot of what's going on is that people who do not want to face the actual reason behind, the actual reasons they're afraid, the actual reasons for their anxiety and their dread. Oh, here's this virus. We can be afraid of that. And we can do things like the the uh, mask thing and the social distancing and the lockdowns and all these ritualistic, fetishistic actions wow. as a way of not paying attention to, as a way of distracting ourselves from the things we're actually afraid of. Yep. And so this is why, for example, I don't know what, what things are like over on, on your end of the world, but here in the United States, if you want to, the, the major division between the people who are still, you know, they've been vaccinated, they've gotten a booster shot, and they're still wearing masks and doing social distancing, they're all in the comfortable classes. They're all well-to-do. Come over here on the poor side of the river where I live, nobody worries about that crap. <laughs> and so there is a very, the, the, there is a class distinction. There is an, a wealth distinction between the people who are frightened and the people who are not. Yes, that's very much the case here as well. Yeah, yeah, case. and so and and especially it's especially in across the board. You there in in most of the industrial world, the political party that used to speak for the working classes sold out. Usually in the, in the 1980s or thereabouts, started speaking for the managerial classes instead, for the professional managerial class. They got the suits and they got the the big smiles and they got the um, you know the the oh, we're really friendly. We're really friendly with big corporations now, and they basically ditched the interests of the working class completely, but still expected the working class to vote for them, and that had that strategy has had a very limited shelf life. And so um, a lot of people in the managerial class who have been very used to um, living very high on the hog for the last little while are finding themselves faced with um, potential, potential loss of power, potential loss of wealth, above all the loss of identity. Because it is central to the point of view of the, of the, the sort of new left, the, the upper class privileged left, that they're the smart kids in the room. They're the, they're the good people, the smart people, the educated people, the, one who are doing the, the people who are doing the right thing and leading society the way that it ought to go. And the mere fact that that always amounts to they get more privileges than everyone else gets dumped on never gets through the, the sort of filter. And yet now they're facing millions and millions of people who have been crapped on over and over again in the name of the good people, the, the, you know, et cetera, who are saying no. You're just another corrupt, gluttonous aristocracy that's been pursuing its own interests at the expense of everyone else. And they can't deal with that. That literally negates everything in their mindset. And so they're melting down. And so the virus gives them something to be afraid about so they don't have to look at themselves. Mm. So they don't have to look at what they have become, and especially here in the United States where we have the baby boomer generation. I'm speaking of my generation here. We can cut in talking about my generation if you want to. Um, who sold out after that Dionysian interval in the 1960s, who comprehensively sold out, cashed in their ideals, uh, not just once, over and over again. And now they're being faced by younger generations who are saying, look what you have left us, not very much. Look at the mess you've made for us. And they can't handle it. Because they're still in their minds, they're still those idealistic kids with long hair who are going to change the world for the better. And the fact that again, they're just a bunch of corrupt, old, privileged, um, well-to-do, greedy corporate clones. It's just, you know, again, that to face that would be to accept self-annihilation on a, oh, I mean, a psychological level. I don't think they could do that. Being in that position and facing that. It's... Yeah, imagine, imagine just facing that for a moment, looking yourself in the face and, and saying, I am everything I hated when I was 20. And this, like, so in the in the UK now, the way of resolving it is there's this, like, myth of racist Britain. Apparently now, like, everyone outside of London is a raging racist. <laughs> Yeah. Well, ra yeah, ra racist. The, the whole yeah, the whole racism thing. Um, that's an attempt to not talk about class. 
Exactly. exactly. If we shriek about race often enough, people will forget that the real division is one of social class. I was fascinated to see on a Tory website, one of my readers linked me to this, um, the, the Tories of all people talking about how, no, it's not race, it's class, and we need to make um, you know, the, these educational things available to kids of all skin colors um, based on whether they, they're coming from a deprived background. I'm saying the Tories are saying this? <laughs> okay, I am looking at the moon, I'm looking up at the sky to see if the moon is blue. <laughs> 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 yeah, a blue ribbon Holstein bore alive to insurance salesmen. Wonders are happening. <laughs> <laughs> there is no Labour Party. I mean, the British Labour Party is done. They're absolutely okay. fucking done. Yeah. Just... Uh, just watching them. Well, and the thing is, they're stuck. Because again, remember, they, they have to believe that they are the smart kids in the room. They are the good people. They know what's right. It's their job to tell everyone else what to do, not to listen. They can't listen because if they listen to someone else, that means they're wrong. And that's the thing they can't stand more than anything else because they're right. They've got the truth. They know what's what. They have the, spe- the educations and the expertise, and it doesn't matter a hill of beans because they've been following stupid policies that have hurt an enormous number of people and have benefited their own class. <laughs> and, so what, is, what does that mean for their power standing then? Because if um, they're not listening, something exactly. might they not, I mean, very much so. Right now, um, based on what I've read, of course, I'm on the other side of the pond, so it's kind of, I, I, I have to base this on what I've seen. The Labour Party is hemorrhaging members. There's like 500 people quitting every day. Um, they are hemorrhaging donors. They're having to lay off people from the national staff because they can't afford to pay to make payroll. They are, you know, they, every every general election. How many general elections has it been since Labor's won? <laughs> you know, it's been a while, and and they can, you know, they've squeaked out a couple of by elections here and there, but as often as not, it's been Tories taking some, you know, some seat mm-hmm. that's been Labor since 1923, and so no, Labor is in deep trouble, and unless mm-hmm. they can snap out of that fantasy of being the people who know what's right and and are supposed to tell everyone else what it is, unless they can actually start listening to their constituents and not just doing. The kind of the kind of goofy stage things that Starmer was doing, you know, where they they handpick half a dozen former Labour voters who were going to come in and talk to him, and he was going to listen. Come on, <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. absolutely, <laughs> I, I follow you in that. Um, I guess that the aim of my question was was less about the political landscape in Britain, but rather mm-hmm. about how this larger temperament of people um, mm-hmm. tell, you know, we know, you know, mainstream baby boomers who take themselves too seriously with regards to ownership of moral yeah. truths. And so when I look at a Google, I see mm-hmm. the same pattern as you've described with regards to the Labour mm-hmm. Party of, of the smart kids in the room telling everyone else how they should think and believe and what's the right thing. Mm-hmm. So what with Google, would you also say that their power is waning or maybe not? Um, because morally. Not, no, that basically, basically what's happening there is that there are a growing number of alternatives. It's like, a, you know, there's this sort, of, this sort of surface level where Google and Faceplant and all the other ones reign supreme. And then you go looking at what's going on elsewhere and an enormous number of people have stopped using Facebook, have stopped using Google. I don't use Google for a search, as a search engine at all these days. It gets me bad results. <laughs> it doesn't get me what I want to find. It gets right, me what right. um, Google wants want me to, to find, which is not of interest to me. Yes. And so um, more and more, it, it's, this is something that happens, especially in America. So you end up with these huge corporations that get a temporary stranglehold on some aspects of business, whether it's General Motors, whether it's IBM, whether it's AT&T, which used to be our phone company and so on. And everything's fine. You just have this sort of surface layer. And meanwhile, the bottom's dropping out underneath. It's like ice that melts from the bottom. And it looks all smooth and perfect, and then it starts to crack. And by the time it starts to crack, it's all over. And so what I expect to see with Google is that sometime, eh, probably in the next 10 years, 
It may be antitrust legislation, breaking it up. It may be the simple fact that so many people are not using Google anymore, they start hemorrhaging advertising revenue, or what have you. I expect them to crash and burn. I expect them to be about as important um, in the field of um, in the field of computers as RCA. That's another example. Radio Corporation of America used to dominate the radio field. It doesn't even exist anymore. It was sold to a to a Japanese combine, I think, 30 years ago. Hmm. Google will go the same way. It's it's the normal cycle of the rise and fall of American monopolies. It's run by kids, isn't it? That's the other thing. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's well, it's it's run actually. It's it's staffed by kids. <laughs> it's run by the stock market. It's run by by major investors, most of the institutional, who um, you know don't actually don't have to provide that much guidance, but they can when they want to. And you know, as as usual, having leader, leadership by committee um, ends up with utterly unimaginative repetition of failed proper, of failed policies. So. Um, yeah, I expect them to go down. Mm-hmm. Brilliant, brilliant. This has been this has been a quite fast paced conversation. <laughs> I tend to do that. <laughs> yes, and it's been fascinating. Well, thank you. Absolutely fascinating. I, I, you know, part of me wants to dive a little bit into your relationship with Druidry. Uh, I know this is a little mm-hmm. bit of a pivot from the from the direction we've been taking uh, thus mm-hmm. far in the conversation, but still, I have no problem. I have, I have absolutely no trouble discussing that. Okay, so like, what? How, could you how, perhaps how did, tell how us did a little I end bit up about becoming a Druid? Yeah. Yeah. How did you end up taking taking the path that you have uh, in your life okay. across the Druid well, uh, magic? Well, it's. Why didn't you become a banker, John? Yeah, if 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 I were if <laughs> I were the mind like this. <laughs> well, basically, okay. To start with, you know, growing up in the South Seattle suburbs in the 1960s and 1970s, I found I found suburban life insanely boring and um, and one dimensional. It was all so plastic, so fake, and so growing up in that, I, I was passionately interested in anything that was less dull. So of course I got because this was in the 60s and 70s. The sort of strange phenomena were, were popular on the bookstalls and this kind of stuff. And so I, I got into UFOs and I got into mysterious this and strange that. And I was a, I was an expert on werewolf trivia by age 10. I mentioned I have Asperger's syndrome. <laughs> yeah, and so, um, but. One of the things that happened was that I kept on running across these little references to magic, not as something, you know, a plot element in the in the fantasy novels that I devoured in those days, um, not as you know something in fairy tales, but as something people actually did. And um, you know, being a shy, bookish kid um, who had very limited social skills, um, I got most of what I knew about it by reading. And so what you could get in the mid-1970s when I started really seriously looking for that was some basic Golden Dawn material. That that was my focus for many years. It was not a perfect fit. On the one hand, I don't do the Judeo-Christian thing. I've I've never even been baptized. (laughs) And... um, so I, the, the very Judeo-Christian symbolism of the Golden Dawn system was kind of, okay, well, I'll deal with this because that's what I've got. But, and then there was a simple fact that most of my really powerful spiritual experiences always occurred outdoors in, in, in you know, natural settings. And so it happened once, you know, after a long series of doing stuff with various kinds of Golden Dawn related magical practices. I was involved in a magical lodge in the Seattle area. One of the other guys who was in the lodge was a druid. He was a member of the Order of Bards, Obates, and Druids, um, which is, I think, still the largest druid order in the world. And he was part of a little group that was active in Seattle. We got to talking and ended up joining. And I really liked it. Mm-hmm. And so I spent, I think I spent five and a half years working through their complete study program. It was a correspondence program and getting very deep into that and going, wow, this is cool. And <clears throat> so kind of, I got to the end of that. And there, and so I started looking around, was there any other Druid material out there that was available? And I, I, I dabbled in a couple of groups 
and I ran across references to this this group that nobody knew much about anymore called the Ancient Order of Druids in America. And the, the reference book where I found a discussion of it, they thought it was horrible. It was old-fashioned. It was stuffy. It was stodgy. It was Masonic. It blah, blah, blah. I'm going, wow, that sounds cool. So I, pr- I proceeded to spend the next, what was it, three years trying to find them. It turned out I actually knew somebody who was involved, but he didn't know I was interested. I didn't know, I didn't know he was in. We finally made contact. I, I discovered I made the, I was put in contact with the Grand Grove of the Ancient Order of Druids in America. Um, the entire order consisted of 11 very elderly people. And so, and they, they had been, it was, it was, it was not quite defunct. It was dormant, let's say. And we got to talking and they, they, they knew that I had this background in magic. They knew I had background in, in organizations that I had been the head of some lodges and things like that. And so after I joined, they proceeded to suggest that I become the head of the order and see if I could bring it back to life. And so in, that was how in 2003 I got pitchforked into the role of Grand Archdruid of the Grand Grove of the Ancient Order of Druids in America at a time when that was, you know, that and 350 would get you an overpriced cup of coffee. It's full. And, yeah. <laughs> and so, so I was, um, so that, I, I, was, I held that office for 12 years before I stepped down and left it, to, left it to, to have, for someone else to have fun. And, of course, during that time, I had to do druidry pretty much 24-7 because I was, my, my job was to take this almost defunct order and get it on its feet again. And I succeeded. We, you know, we went from those 11 members to, I think, I think we had a little better than 1,200 members when, when I left, and it's bigger now. But um, I was doing druidry all the time, simply because I needed to. I had to be available for people. I had to do teaching. I had to do ri- rituals and initiation and blogging and blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> So after I, um, after I stepped down and became an archdruid emeritus and kind of backed away from active involvement, I did a lot of other things. And I'm still doing other things. I'm still, you know, I'm still involved in druidry. I'm still a member of Obata and of AODA. And I've got some other druid initiations in there too. But it was it was less the, that you know I found my path in druidry. It was more that druidry kind of found me, and I was available. That's cool, man. It's 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 been interesting to me that this like hmm, symbol path of druidry has opened up in my own like mimetic landscape recently. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. I I followed perhaps the. Uh, archetypal new agey path of someone my age of getting very into yoga and Hindu mm-hmm. spirituality, spirituality for a while and spent some mm-hmm. time in India and it's fucking awesome um but then over the last year or so I've started to go I don't really know any of these stories none of these gods really speak to me that well but I do mm-hmm. have a background like I spent a lot of time as a kid in Wales and Anglesey mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. druids are there i've been to some insane burial sites in angles oh yeah now, now i'm starting to get this like slight druidic flavor coming to me and like so i think <laughs> i said to you in uh mm-hmm. in my my premium linkedin message that i've got your uh druidry handbook that i've been slowly mm-hmm. teaching myself some of the uh, like the simple practices the like invoking of the elements and uh, mm-hmm. what, Let's see. Well, yes, 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 indeed. And I'm kind of like <laughs> fascinated by what's going on with Druidry at the moment. Like, is it, how big is it? How many people are there? Um, I, the, the only census that I know of is some years out of date, but at that time there were about 2 million of us Okay. worldwide. And so it's not a large religious group by any means. Um, it and of course that that two million is divided between um, more little druid groups than you could shake a sickle at. Um, there are, w- one of the typical things that druids do is that they they come up with a neat idea and they say, well, why don't we found our own druid order to do this? And it's cool because most druid organizations, you're welcome to join as many as you want to. And so there are plenty of people who belong to three and four and five different orders. Um, I'm kind of abstemious and only belonging to four. <laughs> What's the hallmark of a druid practice? As opposed um, to- the hallmark of a druid practice, they're, they're, they're kind of, as, as you'd expect, there are three. Okay. The first is that there is a relationship to nature. Right, yeah. It always has some relationship to the natural world. 
The second is that it has a historical connection to um, either to what little we know of the ancient Druids or to the Druid revival, the movement of Druid spirituality that got going in the 18th century. Um, and the third one is that it is very personal. It is not about telling other people what to do. If you find somebody who claims to be a Druid and is busy saying, well, you ought to do this and you ought to do that, and that's wrong, um, ignore them. Most Druids do. <laughs> it's a very, it's, if you know your astrological symbolism, it's very Uranian. It is very much focused on uh, find your own kind of Druid to be. And so th those three are kind of the, kind of the hallmarks of the, of the system. Sure. Well, system. The system is exactly what it isn't. The movement, the sort of the general tendency. <laughs> nice. Well, that appeals to me. Let, let me ask you another kind of semi question of personal interest being here sure. in the UK. What the fuck's going on with Glastonbury? <laughs> <laughs> well, now, I, I, have, I have only been there twice, okay? I was there once in, in, in 2003, and I was there once in 2014. So perhaps you can tell me what's going on with Glastonbury. I mean, I don't know what it's up to. Do you, what is it up to now? Well, I mean, I don't know. I'm not an expert in the place at all. I've been three times in my life. I went mm -hmm. once when I was 17 with some people before I really got a flavor for anything magical. And then I went mm -hmm. November of last year with a friend of mine who's, who's mm -hmm. not any, into any of this stuff. But I was like, okay, something's, there's a feel here. And I went back with my friend oh, Sam. Yeah a month ago and we actually went with this mentality of we want to try and make a short documentary about the place so mm -hmm. we kind of mm -hmm. we were just asking questions to everyone and opening doors and it's almost like the place the way i describe it it's wrapped up in this beautiful performance art of being itself everybody's mm -hmm. kind of there because it's glastonbury yeah and, and there's yeah, this it, sense it, like there's older mm -hmm. cultists there's mm -hmm there's people there's like hippies who moved down in the 60s and 70s that there's the younger generations of travelers mm -hmm. who aged. Well, there's, yeah. all sorts there's quite a people. substantial group of people who are lsd casualties as well yeah there's also <laughs> mass casualties. another the type place, okay yeah a little town of nine thousand people in the british countryside in the shadow of this hill with a massive stone penis on top of it is, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah you know it's Glaston. There are places like this. There are places like this in the world that tend to concentrate, that tend to serve as magnets for the weird. Especially um, mm -hmm. Lyon in France is the traditional French place for occultists. Lyon? Lyon. Okay. It's been, it's, it has been a center of French occultism since uh, the 16th century that I know of. I don't know what's going on there now, but back in the day, it was, it was a very, very busy um, center for all kinds of occult strangeness. Um, yeah, you, you get these places. Prague is another example. Um, half the important magical movements in Central Europe have some kind of link to Prague. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so why is this the case? You know, is there some subtle energy moving through the earth? Quite possibly. Um, is it just an egregore that's been built up? That's a possibility too. Glastonbury is one of my favorite places in the world because it kind of embodies a, an, an England that doesn't exist. Yes. You've you got to remember, Sid, when, 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 I, when I was a kid, you know, there I am in the South Seattle suburbs, um, the, the property on which I was living, um, 25 years before I lived there, was a chicken farm. 50 years before that, it was a forest with bears. <laughs> no history at all. The oldest houses in, in, in Seattle itself date from the 1880s. And that's really old by Seattle standards. And then you have, you know, looked at from this vast distance, you have England, where there's things like Stonehenge, where there's this sense of age and antiquity and occult secrets dating. So there was this, there's this whole American mythology around, around mystic Britain that I wallowed in when I was a kid. <laughs> and Glastonbury embodies that as much as any place could. It's got it pushes all the buttons. And so I love the place. I adore going there. Um, knowing that about half of the thing is a reaction to my own m misbegotten childhood fantasies. But it's cool. Yeah. 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 I, I agree. It, it is an England that doesn't exist anywhere else. But the kind of fascinating mm -hmm. thing has been that 
this world famous music festival has built mm-hmm. around it as well. About this tiny mm-hmm. town, 9,000 mm-hmm. people. And then you get mm-hmm. a quarter of a million people going there with all of the superstars. Mm-hmm. Funny. Yeah, there's something there. Oh, Daniel, is there anything else you wanted to ask? I'm starting to, uh, to mm-hmm. run out of juice. Maybe, uh, maybe one final question uh, that comes to mind. It's a little bit cheeky. What is a secret that you can reveal? <laughs> <laughs> If I could reveal it, it's not a secret. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you know, if it's the, the thing is, here, here's the thing. Things are not secret because they're important. They're important because they're secret. Most of the things that are secrets, it's like, you know, the, secret, the secrets of Freemasonry, how you make the mystic handshake and this kind of stuff, mean nothing. But because you keep them secret, they become they become a focus of energy, they become a focus mm-hmm. of concentration and consciousness. And this immense mound of mystery builds up around them, and, and, and then they actually become powerful. You could change it completely. In fact, back in the day when, when you had um, occult secret societies popping up all over the place, and they all had to have their own secret handshakes and their own strange gestures, you could, you, it could be the most absurd thing in the world that didn't matter. Because taking something and making it secret is a source of power. I knew a guy once who, one of, his, one of his tricks, he had a paperback book which he had wrapped in wax paper and foil and kept it frozen. It was in the freezer. And when he moved from one apartment to the other, he made sure the book did not thaw out. Totally absurd. But it was one of the ways that he worked on his own concentration and willpower by doing something just because he chose to do it for no, good re- no other good reason at all. And he was quite a mage. So doing even absurd things and keeping them secret, because you did not hear about that book unless you actually like, knew him very well. <laughs> mm. I think it was a book about earthquakes in California. You know, the book yes. itself had no importance, but the fact that you know, he had the thing wrapped up like that, that he was going through that, that routine, that served as an anchor for consciousness and a way to kind of pop him out of the ordinary unthinking state of, of uh, low-level brain damage that more or less characterizes people these days. In this paper that I've recently discovered called Techno Kabbalah by J. Lawton <laughs> Winsdale, or Win, mm-hmm. sorry, Winslade, um, He, he quotes and he speaks a little bit about Jacques Derrida and he mm-hmm. says uh, this very interesting concept, which is that Derrida as a trickster magician must deny the existence of the secret while at the same time propagating it by assuming mm-hmm. an occult relationship with the text. So mm-hmm. it, is, it is this skilled revelation of skilled concealment. It's mm-hmm. this very interesting, almost Hegelian way of... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What mm-hmm. do you reveal? What do you do not? What do you preserve as secret yeah, in the preservation exactly. of secret that provides importance? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, secret, secrecy is an art form. Secrecy is an art form, and it can be done. It can be done skillfully. It can become. It can be done done very clumsily. There are there are secrets that are Mona Lisa's, and there are secrets that are, um, you know, paint by number. Powerful. <laughs> sense of keeping a secret i guess because like if i were to come to a lodge and see that there's the secret or the holy of holies that the elders know it like inspires my own growth Uh i might get to find that out yeah and and also if you've been passed the password and the sign and your rule and 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 you must not tell it to anyone you can't just drift through life half conscious You always have to be thinking, can I speak? Can I say this to this person? No. Okay, here's another initiate. I can use this to them, but not to these other people. So it wakes you up. It's pure that, what's that quote? The art and science of making changes mm-hmm. in consciousness in accordance with will. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The to art to will, to dare, and to keep silent. Mm-hmm. As one of my teachers used to say, to know, to will, to dare, and to shut the fuck up. <laughs> with that said 
I think Can we shut uh, the fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've, we've been going on for quite a while. Uh, it's, it's been amazing. It's been, it's, it's been getting on for two hours now. I, mean, I don't mind. It's been a good conversation. Yes, from my side, it's it's been extremely enjoyable. So, so really, thank you for your time. Oh, you're very welcome. I, I I love doing podcasts. They're free publicity, and and I usually have a good talk. Yeah, it's Fantastic. been an absolute pleasure, man. Well, uh, well, we'll you. ask you thank to you. come back at some point then. I, I will look forward to that. Wonderful. Okay. Take care of yourself, my friend. Yeah, you too now.